Hello, everybody. Um, this is the next in our series of antisocial behaviour injunction webinars. My name is Iris Ferber. I'm Stefan Liberatsky. And we are both uh, housing specialists at 42 Bedford Row, uh, talking to you about antisocial behaviour injunctions, common defences. So, what do we mean by defences, Stefan? Because we're not talking, are we, about capital D statement of case defence. No. This is an injunction application. Um, we're not talking about technical legal arguments, though we're also talking about that. We're talking about the different kinds of responses that the subject of an antisocial behaviour injunction application might raise. And because quite often that person is not the tenant, it might be a family member, it might be a visitor, let's call them the defendant for the purposes of this webinar. And probably initially that person is going to be responding to this application in a witness statement. So, um, does that, do you agree with that? Yes. Uh, why, why won't they do uh, like a defence, for example? Well, because remember, this is an application, not a claim form. Mm. With a, an antisocial behaviour injunction, you are issuing an application for an injunction under a statutory power. You are not obliged. In fact, you're, there is no provision to file a claim form or a particulars of claim. So there is not a particulars of claim to defend. So all sense. you've got in those circumstances is a witness statement. And that witness statement needs to say enough to get you past an initial return hearing in front of the judge. So we've come up, haven't we, with a broad list of eight types of responses that might go into a witness statement like that. Yes. Uh, so uh, I'll just outline what those are. Uh, the first is the simple denial of it never happened or you can't prove that it happened. Uh, the second is to say that the antisocial behaviour is someone else's fault and not mine. The third is there's two sides to this story. Uh, the fourth is, uh, yes, it happened in the past, but I've changed for the better. My personal favourite. I like that one too. Uh, number five is you, the landlord, uh, didn't warn me about my behaviour or you haven't supported me as you should have. Six is the landlord, you haven't followed your own policies. Uh, seven is I'm ill or disabled and we'll look at the Quality Act defences there. Uh, and the fi eight final one is lack of capacity. OK, well, those, that's enough to be getting on with, isn't it? There's plenty there. And let's talk about each of those. The first one you mentioned, let me have a look at my list here, is it never happened or you can't prove that it happened. So let's say I'm a um, legal representative. I've got a defendant in front of me. I'm taking instructions from them and they're telling me it never happened. What, do, what goes into the witness statement in those circumstances? Uh, well, what you need to do is look through the allegations uh, in the application and whip state supporting it and respond separately to each of them. It's not enough to just deny uh, in general that any of this happened. Uh, and you need to uh, then think if your client defendant is saying that something just never happened, uh, what did happen on that day? Um, can they say, for example, they have an alibi and they were somewhere else uh, or that something did happen, they were there, but it's not in the way that the application sets it out. Uh, and you need to set out all of that detail in your witness statement. OK. And, um, I, you know, why not just deny it? Why can't I just tackle all that hard work <laughs> of dealing with every single allegation properly? Can't I just deny it and leave it for later? Well, uh, as tempting as it, as it might be, um, you have to do the work. And the reason for that is that um, at the first hearing, the court could, at the very least, make an interim injunction. Remember, it has that power. Okay. Uh, under the legislation. And actually, uh, it's quite a broad power, isn't it? It, it quite it often is. does happen that yes. an interim injunction is made. Uh, and breach of interim injunction is just as serious as breach uh, as a final injunction. Okay. Um, so you need to set out your stall, uh, ideally, before the first hearing. Um, now, you, that's not to say you have to go through uh, every gap in the evidence and lack of documents at that stage. Um, you, that comes later when you prepare for trial. Yeah. But you, uh, for for this stage, at least, you need to be telling your own story in your witness statement. Um, so, well, let's talk it, about when you're, when you're the landlord and you see this. Yeah, so, so um, that's what I was thinking about. So I'm, I'm a landlord, I've got, I'm reading the witness statement that's been prepared by the defendant and it says, uh, you know, this never happened, I, I wasn't there, or, you know, actually it was somebody else, whatever. Um, once I know that that's the defence, I'm going to want, aren't I, to gather some evidence about that. I'm going to have, want to talk to potential eyewitnesses. I'm going to want to look at CCTV. I'm going to want to talk to other neighbours who are not the neighbours involved directly in whatever it is that's being alleged. So there's a lot of work to be done once the landlord has received that initial witness um, 
statement. But of course, as you know, Stefan, we have um, a, a webinar on uh, our YouTube channel, which deals with that, how to gather evidence once the, the, the witness statements have been exchanged. Mm. So let's leave that for now. But let's note that there is work to do by the landlord once they've received a witness statement setting out these sorts of defences from uh, the defendant. And the only thing I'd add is the work will hopefully be easier if you've done the initial groundwork as a landlord before you've issued the application. If there's been yeah. enough time to do if it. If there's been enough time. Which there sometimes yeah. isn't, but absolutely right. Um, okay, then what my, my personal favourite, there is there are two sides. What, 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 um, what do we do with that one? Uh, well, again, uh, as a defendant and advisor, you still need to respond to each allegation separately. You, you can't just put in a general statement of this is all my neighbour's fault. OK. Um, it's worth then breaking down what are the types of defence under this heading. That there, there are a few flavours of it, if you like. Yeah. Um, one you commonly see is there's just a long history between two neighbours who don't get on for whatever reason. Uh, and it is genuinely a, a two sided dispute. If that's what your client's saying, you need to put that full context in your witness statement and uh, where it's not been included in the application. Because I would guess it's very easy to say, you know, easiest thing in the world to say, oh, it's, you know, there's 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 two sides to this. It, mm. What makes it persuasive is the detail. The detail, you need to show why. Um, and, it, and it could be uh, a slightly different flavour of it is that there's a particular allegation um, that is technically true, but it's been taken out of context. So the, the landlord is alleging that the defendant shouted at their neighbour, well, the context could be that the neighbour had just thrown some rubbish into their garden yeah. uh, and they were responding to that. And so I suppose what, what you're saying is you could have a situation where the application for the injunction just says the defendant shouted at mm. the neighbour and doesn't give the other piece of information, which is that that was a, re a response to something else that had happened. It yeah. was the neighbour's fault that was equally bad or worse. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Uh, and then you see some um, types of behaviour where the behaviour of, of the defendant is actually perfectly innocent, but the neighbour, for whatever reason, has taken it out of context. Um, and, and one example um, that's uh, been quite uh, well known amongst tenant lawyers recently is the uh, Cara Williams case and Rosebury Housing Association. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the case that went, was in the county court in London, but it's been very widely reported. Yes, uh, and uh, she had a severe obsessive compulsive disorder, which caused her to film absolutely everything in her flat. Uh, but also and outside, and, outside in, and including her neighbours. Right. Um, but the, the way that the landlord put the case was she is filming her neighbours. But the important context was actually she filmed absolutely everything and she's not she wasn't targeting it as her neighbours. And it was a result of her OCD. Uh, and none of that was included properly in the yeah. application when it was first put in. Yeah. So that's that those sorts of things, the lack of context is is a good defense. So yeah. what, what does a Let's just, again, just touch on what does a landlord do when faced with that sort of mm -hmm. um, um, response in a witness statement? I think it can be, as happened with the Cara Williams case, I think, really, that some neighbours in a, in a street where there are problems are particularly insistent, are particularly um, putting pressure on housing officers to do something about it. A particular neighbour mm -hmm. and that housing officer perhaps felt feels so much pressure that they end up taking sides on behalf of one neighbour yeah. against the other neighbour and if once a response from a, a defendant to an injunction application is received that highlights a situation of that kind really the landlord then needs to step back a little mm -hmm. bit investigate interview other neighbours again as we said before decide whether the allegation, the particular allegation that we're talking about, what it, whichever allegation it may be, in, in the run of allegations in the application form, is that still good? Can it be proved? Because if you've got, if you're a landlord and you've got 20 allegations, and for some of them, there is a really, it looks on investigation like it really is six of one and half a dozen of the other, and that's not been properly yeah. um, addressed, it may be better just to drop those allegations, not pursue them and fix on the remaining 10, 12 allegations where that response isn't part yeah. of the defendant's case. So if you, if you pursue all of them, the, the judge could take a view of the ones that you shouldn't have really pursued and that might colour their view of the ones that actually are In fact, are that good. often happens. Yeah. If you yeah. keep on with the weak allegations, you, you dilute the strength of your strong allegations. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the, the third uh, defence that we outlined at the start was um, that it is someone else's fault. So, so what do we mean by that, Iris? Well, I think there's really two types of, of defence here. 
One of them is the straightforward one, uh, which we sort of already talked about, which is it was some, I don't know who it was, but it was somebody else. It wasn't me. I have an alibi. Now, I think we've already covered what you do with that. That's a, that's a, a matter of stating in the statement what you say happened or didn't happen and who you say did it or yeah. didn't do it. The other type is much more difficult. What if what you're saying is it's not my fault that this has happened, but my son did it mm. or my daughter did it or somebody who's visiting me regularly. Yeah, I see that a lot. It. See it a lot. Or a partner who visits me but doesn't mm. live with me did it. Um, it is complicated. Let's start to really think about how to deal with that sort of response in a witness statement on behalf of a defendant. Let's step back for a moment and think about what the test is for the behaviour that gets made the subject of an injunction. And it's section one of the Act, isn't it? It is. It is section one of the 2014 Act, and it's actually narrower than you might think. It is that the respondent, so that's the defendant in our uh, scenario, the respondent has engaged or threatens to engage mm -hmm. in antisocial behaviour. So the respondent is the person yeah. who is engaging or threatening to engage. Now, yes, let's remember that the phrase antisocial behaviour is given a very, very, very wide meaning in Section 2 of the mm -hmm. 2014 Act. It, it only has to be conduct that has caused or is likely to cause nuisance or annoyance to a neighbour. And something that is likely to cause annoyance, which is the absolute lowest bar, almost is anything. really almost anything. Yeah. But nevertheless, coming back to section one, it does need to be antisocial behaviour engaged in by the respondent yeah. or threatened by the respondent. So let's say it's children. If it's a five-year-old child, hmm. I think it's very difficult on a factual level to say that the person responsible is the five-year-old child. You're going to have a little difficulty as a landlord in saying the parent, yeah. the defendant parent, is the person that is responsible for engaging in that behaviour if they're not controlling their child. And for a good reason, you can't get an injunction against a five-year-old anyway. No, because that's if you, right. the minimum age is 10. To minimum age 10. So certainly under 10, you've got good arguments about uh, if you're a landlord, this defendant is the person that mm -hmm. is threatening to engage or is engaging in, in the antisocial behaviour if, if, if their child under 10 is doing it. Mm. We'll, we'll come back to the level of control that the parent has in a moment, but let's just finish on ages. If the child is 16 or 17, it's really quite a different thing, isn't it? You can really see that it might be a perfectly good argument for a defendant to say that they are not the person engaging in the antisocial behaviour, it's their 17-year-old yeah, child. I, I've seen that, that they say my son has joined a gang and there's nothing I can do nothing to, to stop him. Now, Let's uh, differentiate injunctions here from possession proceedings. Mm. In a possession claim, that may well not be enough. If you are the parent and you're not in control of your child, you'll have tenancy terms that say you're obliged to control mm. your children. But for an injunction, which is a different thing, what the Act requires is that the parent is engaging in the antisocial behaviour. So if, if it's actually the 17-year-old who's engaging, then you're then it's a good defense. Yeah. You're going to be, you're going to be able to argue that you're not the person who's engaging in the antisocial behaviour as the parent. Now, then there's a grey area. Between a five-year-old and a 17-year-old, there's everything in between. And a, an 11-year-old or a 12-year-old might be um, a, a situation where you can argue that you are not the person engaging in the behaviour, or in some circumstances that might not be a terribly good argument. Yeah. Then the other aspect of this, Stefan, is not just the age of the child it's how much are you as the parent doing so mm. i'm you know you are you're sitting as a representative of the defendant taking the instructions for the witness statement you're going to want to be asking that parent what are you doing to deal with this particularly for older children but it will yeah. also apply to younger children as well generally speaking you'll always want to ask these questions is the parent really actively in, encouraging the mm. behaviour? Then you're in, you're in trouble arguing that they're not Some, that they're not engaging in it. Sometimes they themselves. do, and yeah. sometimes they do. Um, are they okay? Maybe not actually encouraging the behaviour, but are they really closing their eyes to the problem and just refusing to deal with it completely? Yeah. That's also difficult because you could argue that by by acting in that way, actually they are the ones who are adopting the behaviour yeah. of the or child, causing it in a sense. Causing it. Yeah. Then we get to grey area. Are they sort of half-heartedly 
trying to control the child's behavior, but really not trying terribly hard. That I think shades into um, territory where it's a possession claim that should have been brought mm. rather than an injunction because they're trying, but they're not being very firm and they're not really doing a terribly good job. Are they actually engaging in that behavior themselves? Yeah. It's, it, it, that becomes it's, a, good def- a better defense then if you're the parent. And then finally, right at the end of the spectrum, a parent who is absolutely doing their best to control their child, but is incapable, the child is not capable of being controlled. There you really, you really do have a defense that you should run. Yeah, of saying you are not the person engaging in the yeah. antisocial behaviour. Um, um, so, so what about the other situation where um, it's not a, a child or family or property, but it's a visiting friend or a visiting partner who causes trouble every time they're well, there? Well, there the control is the most important thing. So we're not talking now about age. We're talking about the nature of the relationship mm-hmm. and the ability of that person, the defendant, to control the behaviour. The most obvious question that you're asking at that point is, is this a relationship where your client, that your defendant, who is giving this, who's going to be signing this witness statement, are they actually a vulnerable person who is either under the control of, a, of another person, subject to domestic violence, subject to domestic abuse more widely, at a level of control, coercive control, mm-hmm. where they, in effect, can't tell that person to go away. Yeah. Uh, they can't call the police on that person because... Their, their, their relationship with that person means that if they call the police on them, they might be assaulted next time that that person visits them. Yeah. In those sorts of circumstances, actually, you've, the defendant has a good defence to the injunction application because the defendant will want to be saying, I am not the person doing this antisocial behaviour. Mm. It is this other person. And actually, you, my landlord, should have applied for an injunction against them, yeah. not against me. Uh, you should have helped me um, to deal with this problem in some other way. You should have provided me with assistance and you haven't. So the, the question for friends and partners and visitors is what's the nature of the relationship? Yeah. Can this person realistically exercise control over that person? If yeah. they can't, then there's a good defence there. Yeah, that makes sense. And what about I've changed? Stefan, uh, what about I am now a totally yeah. different person from yes. when I behaved in this terrible way? Uh, th- th- this is one uh, I, I like, uh, the, the conversion. Um, so that a person uh, might say, yes, I, I used to behave uh, not very well in the past. I accept that, but I've changed for the better and it won't happen again. And how um, do you make that stick? Because we all, we all know like about cases where that's yeah. been said. Um, it, it's easy to say it, but you have to show it and you show it with, uh, with detail. Um, you set out a, uh, a chronology of what's happened in this person's life. You attribute whatever the reason was that they were behaving like they used to, uh, and then the reason why it is that they've changed. Um, and it, whatever that is, it, it could be, um, for example, they've had some counselling uh, or that they were going through a difficult patch in their personal life that's now over. Um, but you need to set out that narrative and, and try and tell a story of why things have changed and that they're, they're now but genuinely better, and there's been a break from the past. Um, okay. If well, you're the landlord, yeah. um, you, you, you see this. Yes, um, and you're how... sceptical. <laughs> yes, sceptical. About it. Uh, so how might you respond to that? Well, um, an obvious one might be that this person said this before, they've made assurances in the past they were going to change, and, and they didn't. Yeah. Um, there might be gaps in their story that don't really add up, that they're telling, um, or the timing might be too suspicious. Um, what this, do you mean? What, what, what well, like? The, the apparent conversion of good behaviour has come just as soon as the injunction application has been served on them or uh, one, or as soon as the landlord told them they were about to take them to court. Um, and in that situation, you would be saying that you know, we don't believe this is genuine and uh, if the uh, if an injunction is not made, they're just going to carry on um, like, like they were before. So to avoid all of those arguments, I, I, I suppose, as you were saying, the, the, the key is the detail. It, it it's is. to really tell the story and mm. explain what the trigger was for the change. Yeah. The, the conversion from a, you know, a bad, badly behaved person to a well-behaved person. Yeah. Really, really give that a flavour of, yeah. of why, how that's uh, and, uh, and a witness statement from someone who knows them well um, can be really helpful for that as, as well.
Okay, and what about um, the next one that we had on the list, which was my landlord didn't warn me about this or yeah. my landlord hasn't supported me. Yeah. Um, that's often something that will apply when the defendant is a tenant and there's a relationship there. Uh, absolutely, yeah. It, it won't apply really whether where they're a visitor or an outsider. Yeah. But um, now where they're a tenant, they're running this defence. Um, be careful because sometimes it won't be a good defence. Uh, um, like, like when? Well, if your tenant has... Uh, or, uh, client has set fire to the neighbor's house it's not a great defense to say my landlord shouldn't have warned me not to set fire to the neighbor's house mm, um, yes i can see what it means it's a bit of an yeah. extreme example but well, it, yeah, it, 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 it does it happen, does happen. Um, exactly, but yeah. it more often in most cases where the alleged antisocial behavior is less serious and it's a it's an ongoing pattern it's something that defendants can and do say but it can be difficult to prove um that they've not been warned you, so what, okay, so let's say, for example, I, I'm taking instructions mm. from a client, defendant, and they say, oh, I never had a letter, they never called me, the first thing I heard about this minor noise nuisance mm. issue was when uh, an injunction um, or application landed on my doormat. Do I just stick that straight into the witness statement as is? Uh, no, you need to be careful and not just take their word for it. Um, Why not? Because uh, it might be documented uh, by the landlord, but they haven't put it in their initial witness statement. What um, might be documented? Uh, that they've given warnings, uh, held meetings with the person oh, right. so, and so on. So if they... it's not mentioned in the witness statement of the original the original okay. witness statement supporting the application, that doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't yeah. done. Uh, okay. And it might be that it hasn't gone in the initial witness statement they've not had time because uh, right. it's an urgent matter to, to include all of that detail. So what, what do you do? Uh, so what you can do is um, you can say in the witness statement that you uh, want full disclosure of yeah. any warnings that have been given to date yeah. um, and you essentially reserve your position and wait and see what they come back with um, and if then what they come back with is, is thin or non-existent then you really can run that defence and say that there were no warnings uh, or support offered or whatever it is. Um, but very often they, they they can come back and show it because it, from a common sense point of view, landlords don't want to take a matter to court because it's expensive and time consuming. They And they have policies that they usually follow by by going through the warning process. Oh, well, that brings me on to the, la the next, well, the next yeah. topic. So shall I yes. talk a bit about that? Because one of the things which is connected to warnings mm. um, and support is policies. And a lot of landlord policies do include um, provision for steps prior to uh, going to court for injunctions, including things like written warnings, offering support and so on, mm. but other things too. So for example, you might have um, a policy, this is relatively common, where if there are noise um, complaints between neighbours, then um, steps, particular steps will be taken to try and resolve those, like exploring, at, having a surveyor's report, exploring the possibility of soundproofing, uh, or if it's um, what appears to be a tit-for-tat type relationship breakdown yeah. between two neighbours, a policy might say that mediation will be attempted yeah. before an injunction is applied for. So all sorts of things like that are often included in landlord policies relating to antisocial behaviour. Is, is it always worth running this defence if you've got really serious allegations? No, I think a bit like what you said about warnings and uh, support, if you've set fire to your neighbour's house, mm. whether or not a landlord has followed a policy in applying for an injunction isn't going to be terribly impressive to a judge. Yeah. So it, this, is, this is really one to focus on where it is more ordinary type allegations, allegations of noise, nuisance, allegations of low level antisocial behaviour. Yeah. And, and what do you do in the witness statements? Um, you don't need to do a huge amount, but you do need to go on the website of that landlord mm. and find the policy, yeah. identify the clauses that look like they've been breached and say it's clause 3.2 of this particular policy. Yeah. Say what that clause is, say what should have been done and say that it hasn't been done. Now, I will also mm. add here, Stefan, that this has the similar risk that the previous item had about warnings, about warnings. Yeah. if you simply say immediately based on instructions um, nobody attempted to install sound insulation for example mm. and then you later get disclosure and it turns out that there's been three years of attempts to install mm. sound insulation and your client didn't tell you about it yeah. it's going to severely weaken the client's position on their evidence yeah so it may be depending on the obviousness of the point it may be better to say 
in the witness statement, the policy, this clause of this policy says so and so and so. Mm. We seek disclosure of the steps that have been taken to comply yeah. with these clauses in the policy. And, I, and then if the disclosure yeah. does suggest that in fact the policies were not complied with, then you focus on those points once you've had that disclosure. Uh, and what if it at the point of drafting the witness statement? You can't find the policy, it's not on their website, but you think it's a point you might want to take. You can certainly, in a witness statement, say that you will be asking the landlord to um, produce its policies relating to uh, dealing with antisocial behaviour, and you will be considering whether those policies have or haven't been complied with okay. prior to issuing the application. That's perfectly OK. And why not? Yeah. Put, you, why not put it in there? Yes, most of the time landlords do comply with these policies or things are so serious that there are good reasons why they haven't, but that's not always the case and there's no harm in including that. Yeah. Um, now, what about the really big one, the one that is complicated and the one that comes up perhaps in our um, cases that we advise on, the more complicated cases, the most often, yes. which is vulnerabilities, yeah. ill health, disability, those sorts of defences. Um, well, it, those watching might know that Iris and I also practice in employment and discrimination, uh, and uh, so we work with the Equality Act quite a lot. Uh, some uh, landlord and tenant advisors uh, and specialists may not work with it every day, and it is a complex um, uh, area. But In fact, it's probably a separate it, webinar. It is, say. it is, but we can, we can cover it broadly, and let's step back and look uh, factually, there's usually two distinct issues that get raised under this broad heading. Um, one is where there's an illness, uh, and it might be a disability or it might not be, um, that has caused the person to behave in the way that they do. Um, so you're saying it's not really their fault or it's difficult for them to, to control their behaviour. The, the other is where they just have an illness or a condition that makes them very vulnerable. And you're saying that the impact of making an injunction against them is going to be very severe and disproportionate. So it's so the point is relevant for both ends of the process. Yeah. It's the initial question of whether or not they've actually they're actually responsible for yeah. behaviour. And mm -hmm. right at the other end of things, it's also relevant to should the court actually be making this yeah. injunction? Because it's the test is is it just and proportionate yeah. to do so? It might not be yeah. if that person's particularly vulnerable. Uh, and in reality, again, um, a lot of conditions could involve both uh, of these, so that it's it's both causing behaviour and it's making them more, more vulnerable right. at the same time. If you're focusing on the causation aspect, yeah. you're usually going to need medical evidence. All right, so it's, you can't just prove it by, by saying it. So does that mean I don't mention it initially in the witness statement at all? You do mention the witness statement. You raise oh. an issue and you say, I have this condition uh, and I, I it's affecting my behaviour uh, in whatever way. Um, but you are going to, at a later stage, ask for permission to rely on expert evidence and attain at that point. But you don't have to have a medical report right at the start. The court won't expect that. Um, and as a landlord, when you see that sort of defence, that's mm -hmm. usually the most likely point we're going to challenge is the causation, the medical causation well, what point. It, that, yeah, but it, let's not forget, mm -hmm. as we both know, mm -hmm. that landlords are also um, very aware and need to be aware that the... Um, the Equality Act carves out from protection. So I mean, if we're talking now about disability, particularly, yeah. um, carves out from the protection of the Equality Act particular conditions, right, which are very common conditions in the social housing setting. And that is addiction to alcohol, addiction to drugs, and tendency to set fires. Yes. Those three things are not disabilities. Mm. They're not disabilities because Parliament has decided that they're not disabilities. So if the only uh, basis for the defence, without any other medical conditions at all, is alcoholism or drug addiction, that's not going to be a disability. That's not going to be a gateway for Equality Act issues. But can but, you still refer to it and rely on it? But, yeah. exactly, that doesn't mean it's not relevant to vulnerability. Mm. That's not a disability question. That's a broad circumstances question. Is that person unwell? Is yeah. that person vulnerable because of, say, a drug addiction? That is going to be relevant. Now, a judge might not like it. It might be of limited mm. value uh, in defending the case to say, well, I am a drug addict and that's why I'm behaving in this way. But it is not something that you can't refer to. It is relevant to all the circumstances. It's relevant to the level of vulnerability of yeah. the defendant if they do have those conditions. But 
you're going to the landlord is going to be saying that's not a disability. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but if you are relying on a specific disability and yeah. the Equality Act um, it, itself, how do you go about that uh, when you're raising your defence? Well, that's that's you know we've talked about that before, weren't we? Because we were saying you can't enter a defence, a formal statement of case type defence to pleading. Um, yeah. a pleading yeah. to an application to an injunction because there's no particulars of claim with an application mm -hmm. for an injunction and yet the points you're making under the Equality Act are technical mm -hmm. points um, so let's have a think what do you do with it um, I, I think there are two things you can do separately from the witness statement we'll come back to the witness statement in a moment you could issue a claim for breach of the Equality Act and raise the issues in a technical way, in a particular as a plain seeking damages mm -hmm. for, for breach of the Equality Act and relying on whichever sections of the Equality Act might apply. We're not going to go into it in detail here, but let's say failure to make adjustments to policies, that would be a failure to make reasonable adjustments under Section 2021 of the Equality Act, or discrimination arising from disability, that would be uh, under Section 15 of the Equality Act, or even a breach of the public sector equality duty, that would be Section 149 of the Equality Act. All those things are technical arguments that you could raise as a claim on behalf of your client defendant in a separate action where you are the claim. So it's a, se a separate claim form of tickets of claim issued against the landlord, but as a in the matter of procedure, you're then going to be asked for it to be consolidated with yeah. and heard together with the injunction. Because you're going to say that the issues are the same. Yeah. But firstly, that, that there's an issue fee there. It's a complex process. It may not be something that actually for this particular case you want to do. So what? Does that mean you can't raise the Equality Act at all? No, mm. it doesn't mean that. You can still say um, in the witness statement, which you're preparing in response to the application for the injunction, that the act of issuing the claim, sorry, issuing the application mm -hmm. for an injunction, and perhaps the act of continuing with that application, even after being told that the defendant has a disability, yeah. that those things are unlawful acts of disability discrimination. Yeah. And you can say that in the witness statement, and the way that you make that work in a non-pleading document like a witness statement is you say okay I'm going to say for example that the unlawful disability discrimination in this particular case is section 15 discrimination that's discrimination arising from disability and the the elements of that are you say this in the witness statement firstly is there some unfavorable treatment and secondly is that unfavorable treatment because of something arising in connection with my disability Mm -hmm. And then you answer those questions. So you having laid that out, you then say, well, obviously applying for an injunction against me is unfavorable treatment because if an injunction is made, then I'm going to be subject to it and that's yeah. unfavorable to me. Or even being taken to court is... Even being is taken to court is, is, is a stressful yeah. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So all of that is un unfavorable mm -hmm. treatment and you just say that mm -hmm. in the witness statement. And then you say, and is it something that arises in connection with my disability? Yes, it is, because I say that the behaviour I'm being accused of is something that I do because of this particular condition that like I have. Like the Cara Williams case. Like the Cara Williams yeah. situation, yeah. exactly. I, the reason I video everything is because of my OCD. That's connected to my disability. Mm -hmm. And it's enough to say that. It's not an overly technical way of doing it. You're just laying out the elements of the statutory test in Section 15 in this example, and then you're saying why it is that your circumstances fit into that. And then you can take a view once that's all done and you've put your witness statement in as to whether you want actually to also issue a claim um, yeah. for breach of the Equality Act with all of the pressure that that puts on the landlord mm. with the potential for compensation being payable if you're successful and use that as a negotiating position to get the injunction proceedings resolved in yes. a sensible way. Makes sense. Um, so that sort of leads us on to the last one, doesn't it, which is lack of capacity. So tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so um, capacity is something that you need to assert as the defendant and show because uh, the court always presumes that someone has capacity unless it's shown that they don't. Uh, and you need to remember that capacity is an issue specific uh, point. Uh, so, for example, a defendant might have the ability to understand what an injunction is, 
they can understand that it's a piece of paper that says you must do this and if you if you do it you'll go to prison potentially or they might, might they might not understand um, that that's about an injunction um, a, a separate issue is that they may understand what an injunction is but they don't have the capacity to control their own behavior and they therefore just can't comply with an injunction even if, even if they understand it and those are two distinct things aren't they they are they are um, so what if what happens if either of those is true, if either the person doesn't have the ability to understand what an injunction is, mm. or, and, or, they can't control their behaviour. Yeah, that, that's just a defence, uh, and it's a complete defence uh, to an injunction application, because the court is not going, and case law says this, um, the court is not going to make an injunction against someone who can't understand it, or who just can't comply with it. So it's a, it is an absolute defence. It is, So if, you, yeah. if you're identifying that sort of lack of capacity, that's got to go into the witness statement. Yeah. Well, who's going to give the witness statement? What if the person, I know yeah. we we're going to come on to this, perhaps just touch on it now, there's also such a thing as litigation capacity, the ability yeah. to give instructions for a witness statement, yeah. that sort of thing. If the person doesn't have that capacity, mm. what do you do about producing a witness statement? Uh, well, uh, the witness statement could come from a family member who knows them well and can say, you know, it, it, it's my brother, for example, and, and he has this condition and he, he can't understand X, Y, and Z. Right. Uh, or the solicitor uh, themselves who are taking the statement might say, I've talked to this person, this is the information I've got from them, but I think they don't understand, don't genuinely understand uh, what is going on for these reasons. And actually, yeah. I've, I've, I've got a couple of cases running where we've done that, where the solicitor is the person who's done the witness statement. And that can be very effective, can't it? it? Can. Because one of the things that solicitors do routinely um, is assess the capacity of the person that's in front of them to give instructions. Yeah. And so that so, you know, a, a judge is going to be impressed by a solicitor, is mm -hmm. going to be um, persuaded, potentially, yeah. by a witness statement from a solicitor who says, I've, I've met this person, I've talked to them, in my, my view is that they don't have the capacity and to understand At this. the very least, even if they're not completely persuaded by that, they will um, ask for, for example, a capacity report to be obtained from a, a psychiatric or psychological expert. Right, because the solicitor is never going to be the final piece of evidence, the solicitor's yeah. witness statement, but it's going to be the initial yeah, piece of raises evidence. raises the issue. So, what, what, so you touched on that report. Mm. What, what sort of medical evidence... Would we be looking at if the capacity was an issue? Yeah. Um, so if it's litigation capacity, so it's yeah. the ability to um, understand the proceedings and give instructions, um, it, there's a standard form that uh, psychiatrists, psychologists are usually ask to fill out, uh, having assessed a person, do, do they have this capacity or not to, to, to engage in litigation? Right. Um, if it's these other issues that I, we talked about earlier about understanding the injunction or being able to comply with it, yeah. you might need a fuller expert medical reports from a psychiatrist or psychologist who's, and, who's done that assessment. And again, as we said before, that doesn't need to be something that's prepared before the no. initial witness statement, does it? Because yeah. often you've got to do that witness statement with not much time yeah. to spare. Uh, yeah. And um, that, that again, it, if you raise the issue at the start, you can then persuade the court uh, to defer the final decision and, and make directions uh, for a, a proper hearing or trial, which can include getting expert medical evidence. Okay. Um, uh, and the, the last point to just touch on and clarify, perhaps, is that if someone lacks litigation capacity and they need a litigation friend, for example, um, that doesn't mean you can't, as the landlord, go ahead and continue with the proceedings, um, provided it, that they can actually understand the injunction that gets made at the end of it. Um, but they need to have the, the appropriate procedure needs to be gone through someone. Who, and that can happen. It's not very common, perhaps, but it can happen that someone can't understand proceedings, but can understand at the end of it what it is they need to do or not do. Um, so I think we're, we're coming to our conclusion now, aren't we, Stefan? Yeah. Um, let, let, let me do a little bit of a summary mm -hmm. on this. So there are lots of different defences to antisocial behaviour injunction applications. Some are entirely fact-based. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it. It never happened. It was somebody else's fault. Or, yes, it was me, but I've completely changed. Mm -hmm. Some are really quite technical. Uh, Equality Act defences, lack of capacity defences, who's got the legal responsibility for children of the family. And then there are some procedural defences, what I would loosely call procedural defences, failures to follow policy, failure to give warnings, not doing things in the right way. Does that seem yeah, like a good that's, summary? That's a good, that's a good uh, overview of it. And, and I would just add that a common theme for all of the ways of defending um, these injunction applications um, whatever the details are, is you need to respond to the allegations individually. You need to set out the detail in your initial witness statement uh, and just be careful not to overstate the case before you've seen the landlord's full disclosure. 
Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. Thank that was a very Iris. interesting yeah. chat. Very nice to talk to you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing you again at the next webinar. Bye now. Bye-bye.